working. Let me just get my mic here. Okay. Um, can we all stand for a Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Just want to note for everyone that Mr. Brenneman and Ms. Pickens are attending via Zoom this evening. We'll now move to the hearing of citizens, three minutes. Um, if there is anyone here to speak, please come forward, um, state your name and print your name and address on, I believe there's a paper with the board secretary. Hello. My name is Mary Jane Caney, and I live at 1645 Skyline Drive in the city of Erie. I just want to bring up a couple of things and, and clarify a couple of things. A couple, it could be a month ago, or I'm not sure how long ago, Kevin Cuneo wrote uh, in a column that the trophies at East High School were thrown out. I have no way of verifying this, and I don't know if it's true or not, but I thought that this was a good time to bring up a couple of things about archives and Erie East High. Uh, in the mid-1990s, when the new school was being imagined, uh, I started a, an archive committee, and there were many um, members who were graduates of East High, and we had contact with graduates from 1923 to that time. At the same time, we raised over $50,000 of private money to have the uh, water fountain backsplashes preserved and placed in the new school. Mm -hmm. Concurrently, the committee and I put together uh, boxes and bosses. We wrapped and packaged the, the uh, trophies and other archives that belong to the school. And we repeatedly asked for a secure location. The only location we were given was what I called the attic of East High School. After I retired in 2006, and, um, and then I was still working with the district, so it probably was around 2014. All that time, we were never allowed access to the archives. So at this, and we wanted to organize them. I'm not saying they were organized in any way, but I thought this was a good time since I read that article uh, in the newspaper that um, it would be good to honor, make sure we were honoring those graduates. I really believe in the Erie City School District. And at that time, I don't remember whether it was 2006 or 2014, probably all that time, I was recommending that some kind of a room in one of the, at least one of the buildings be designated as a museum area for the archives of all the schools, because this district has a rich history as well as a way, it's a way to honor its students and teachers all these years. And I, it's hard to believe that it was 23 years ago that we dedicated your East High School, which is, I realize, no longer at high school. So um, that's what I want to bring up. Uh, I don't know if you, you probably can't answer the question of the trophies, but is there a way that we can resurrect uh, uh, the archives and protect them and organize them and have access to them? Thank you, Ms. Kidding. Does someone want to respond? I know Mr. Harkins had raised, raised the same concern the other day. Well, Mr. Okay, Mr. I'll, Rockman. I'll take it. Um, so when the consolidation occurred, we did not move any of the Erie, East Erie trophies to Erie High. Everything remained at East. <clears throat> the conversation I believe started now because in the new when the, the construction project that's going on underway at Erie High School, we're going to have a new athletic entrance, which is off the back of the building. There is going to be a dedicated area there for a Hall of Fame. And the idea behind the Hall of Fame is that it will be for all of our old high schools leading up to one school being Erie High. Um, 
And so the original plan was that we would create some kind of a committee to decide what trophies would remain at East, what trophies would be brought over to Erie High, and it would be the same thing for Strong Vincent, as well as the Central Falcons. Uh, and in all reality, we really should be talking about the academy teams when they were there. Um, we are about nine months away from that portion of the building being completed. So we've got time in front of us to really put together a plan for what that area will look like. In the meantime, I could tell you that at no time were any trophies thrown away. Uh, we would not disregard our past uh, to for just about any reason at this point. Well, that's, uh, I'm very happy to hear that. They, the trophies weren't the only items and they weren't all athletic trophies mm -hmm. either. Uh, there were school newspapers from 1923 to the time that I retired and uh, literary works and things like that that were all work of the students. So I, I doubt that you checked on that. I know, or maybe you did, I don't know. They were up in what I call the attic and not a secure area. Do you know anything about that? I, I do not. I know what area you are talking about. And I can make sure that somebody goes over there sometime this week to check on that, to see how organized it is, see if everything is still in the condition that it was when it was brought there, right. when the building was erected. Cheerleading uniforms, <laughs> the, uh, cheerleading uniforms, those kind of things that really are quite culturally and historically interesting to people, some people anyways. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I have an archive committee that would be very uh, interested in in uh, working with you somehow, if that's okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam President, yeah, just to clarify, do you know for a fact that stuff is still up there? Because we're speaking about it and you're talking, you're coming across that it's there. I have not put my eyes on them. I have not physically gone up and did an actual inventory of what's there. I was in the building for 10 years as an employee in that building. And during my time, nobody went up there and threw anything out. I will make it a point to visit the building sometime this week so that I can go up to that area and look. I know that we did not move specifically the athletic trophies because I had a phone call from the uh, East alumni person today, actually, at 2.30 asking specifically about the trophies. And we did not touch or move a single one of them when we did the consolidation. I'll be more than happy to go to East, put eyes on everything, see if I can make sense of what's up there, and then report back to the board. Madam President. I, I know it's not my time to talk, but I do <laughs> want to add that we had not had the chance to really organize. They were in plastic tubs. So when you see it, it's not organized. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gulick. Oh, so I um, want you. to let her know that um, it's not like she said, it wasn't only athletics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was at step team. Step team have won several trophies. I have not even laid out on those. On those. Um, so I think I'm happy to hear that you're going to go up. Someone's going to go and lay eyes on them to see what's there and that we're going to do a Hall of Fame because that is history and students have an look up to that and they can proudly say, that was my dad, that was my mom. You know, they can reflect and feel a connection. Thank you. Ms. Tarkins. I have a couple of reactions. When I saw that Kevin Cunio article, it concerned me because although I have no reason to believe that he was right, I didn't want him to be. And I wanted to know, uh, more about it. So I've asked a few people here today. And I was told that uh, an East administrator called Erica Irwin and she attempted to contact Mr. Cunio and didn't succeed. And I give us credit for that. Uh, one thing I want to say is what we want to have, I believe, is a climate where no one would dare take anything. We want we want to like, establish that these items are revered and, and treasured by us so that somebody, an employee or someone who's sneaky in person doesn't just get tempted to walk away with something. In the late 70s, when we operated the museum as a school district, 
There were stolen bases allegedly, and I don't believe they were ever found. And so there's just that template for fear that something uh, could could get legs and, and leave us and we wouldn't know. It. I know that Academy's trophies, a good amount of them are in disarray in a closet of the building. And I think the same as we just heard from Ms. Kane is in the East. I think Vincent stayed with the floor, mm -hmm. as far as I know. And I don't know what happened to the old tech memorial things either. If they're still uh... anyway, the point is I had thought we were going to have a conversation. I still believe we should about this as a board because I don't want to be at odds with that theme to have uh, all of those historical artifacts funneled towards uh, one site, like outlined by you. you know, I've kind of drifted back to thinking they should remain in the buildings where the students who attended their early time. But that shouldn't be decided one way or another by a conversation like this. We should just find that opportunity to consider this, that all of us uh, contribute to the discussion. There's also tiles that were at uh, East and at Roosevelt. I think I've heard that uh, they were in the service center. Is that still true? That is still true. But see, people just say these things and nobody's for sure until it's said here and you give us the assurance. And again, you may not know everything. I'm not saying you're not caring or trying. It's just that how do we know somebody in a position to sneak off or something? We just don't want them to dare do that. So until we formally decide whatever is going to be debated, these things, just please. I think that's all for now. I don't want to dominate the conversation for the meeting. It's important and it matters to people. And uh, there's a lot of treasured items. We should handle it with respect. Thanks, Mr. Harkins. Before we leave the conversation, I do just want to confirm, Erica, you did reach out to Mr. Cuneo, is that correct? The same day. Uh-huh. And, and what was the response from him? There was no response. Okay. So we're not even aware where he got that information before he printed it in the paper? That's correct. Okay. And uh, we, I, we were not even aware of what the, the media inquiry was regarding, or I could have relayed information by message, left some... Right. information saying that's not correct or but yeah. so maybe Mr. Brockman after you lay eyes on everything you could coordinate back with Erica so maybe we can go back to Mr. Cuneo and try again to repair whatever damage was done that'd be great yeah. <laughs> thank you okay any other speakers no okay let's move on um the kind of first item on our agenda is the vacant school board seat so um, I'll start the conversation. You all have in your packet a paper. Um, it says discussion of proposal for filling vacant board seats. Um, Ms. Jones was kind enough to put this together. So we have a couple of decision points to make this evening, and I hope we can have a, a pretty robust conversation to figure out how we want to move forward. So hopefully you all received um, 19 applications in total. Um, I do want to let the board know that Dr. Titus um, decided to um, rescind their application today. So we're down, we're removing Dr. Titus from the list and we're now down to 18 um, applicants. So I, I think our, I, I first wanna open it up for anyone to, if you have comments about the candidates, things that you wanna say, um, just generally speaking about the quality or the number before we move into any decision points. Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Brenneman. Um, I do wanna note that uh, I managed to speak with uh, 15 of the 18 applicants. And um, I would just say that, uh, A, I was surprised by the number of applicants, but B, um, really tremendous pool of candidates uh, that uh, are deeply passionate about the district, about um, the children in the district and um, our educators and the community. And, and uh, we, we have a, a really great selection, and um, I'm really enthused by by um, them. And of the, I haven't heard from back from three of the 18, but I, I I believe that those that I haven't heard from, they they too have some really good, um, strong you know letters and resumes as well. Thanks, Mr. Brenneman, and thanks for contacting them from space where you're apparently living now. So that's very <laughs> cool. <laughs> yes, Ms. James. Um, you know, and reading over, I look at applicants, I see we passed a couple people who were 
formerly employed by the district. Um, it's one person who's still employed by the district. Um, so if it's committed to the board, she'll have to give up the position that she has. Um, but I love it when they say, it's always been my goal to work with the students and the families to give back to the communities. And then you stop and you wonder, well, where you've been all these years? Why come you never took a, a, a run for the school board? You know, um, whatever their reasons may have been at that time, that's not, you know, that's one thing, but um, I do believe there are a couple on this list who did run and they lost, but I'd be glad they submit their names. But we just have to just be mindful. This is to anyone. If you're interested and you have a passion and you're concerned, take a stab and run for it. Don't wait till something comes open and then flood the gates. That's all I'd say. Thanks, Ms. Cooley. Yeah, Madam sure President, um, the young gentleman from the collegiate, the senior, I mean, he, he was phenomenal, but I'd like to know why isn't he sitting here as a student member and then somebody from Erie High? Unfortunately, I think the other uh, young gentleman was 18, 19 or something. He was already out of school. So that applied. That was but, a woman, I thought, a girl. Was it a girl? At Penn State. No, yeah. actually, that's a he's a former student of mine. As a matter of fact, he uh, uh, got an A in my uh, intro to American yeah. government class. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought it was female. Yeah. So I would only say that maybe we could reach out to that young man at Collegiate and put him on as a, a student rep. Yeah, I, I actually thought the same thing, Ms. Sheridan, that it might be time to reboot the student rep program, and maybe he could be our first one, and then, of course, go to Erie High. And I'd also like to reiterate Ms. Cooley's points. Um, we have six seats, right, Mr. Walker? Yes. Six seats on the ballot this spring. So I hope some of these folks will go pull petitions. They should be doing that pretty soon here and, and get on the ballot for sure. Okay, if there's no more general discussion, let's talk about how we move forward. So the first point of discussion is how many of these candidates do we want to invite to speak at our meeting next week? Um, we can open this up. One thought would be, let's have them all come. I mean, they've all taken the time to apply. They could, we can invite them all to come, limit the amount of time they could speak, you know, to a minute or two to just concisely introduce themselves and tell us why they want to run. Um, alternatively, if we feel so inclined tonight, we could start eliminating candidates and ranking them and then only invite our top um, selections to, to speak next week. So let's start on that point. How do we feel about who comes next week to speak at the meeting? Mr. Harkins. Um, Madam President. Oh. Oh. Sorry, sorry, Ms. Pickens. Go ahead. I didn't see your hand. Are we looking to have them speak at the main board meeting uh, or are we looking at having them at the committee of the whole? Like, will we just dedicate the whole committee of the whole to them? If we did a full, if the decision is let everyone come and have their moment, can we commit the committee of whole to them? We could commit the committee of the whole. I think the original thought was we'd have them at the public meeting so that they, they had that opportunity to speak, you know, to the where the public is more, I guess. There's not many of them there either. But I had thought about the main meeting, but again, that's an interesting point. We could we could consider committee of the whole alternatively. Oh, I don't know. I'm not I'm not making that, I'm just thinking. No, but I appreciate the suggestion. That's a good good thought. Um, Mr. Harkins. I always read the thought scrunching in a lot of activity at the committee of the whole, I think that would be putting a lot of pressure on us to start the regular meeting on time. I also think that the regular meeting would be good to do this at because the public would be introduced to these people and see who we are given to evaluate. That was, that's my opinion on that. The other thing is with your first question, if we eliminate people before we give everybody a chance to speak, we might be justifiably criticized for not having given someone a chance to be included. So I'm not saying that's going to be so. We're going to have them speak, and it's going to be brief. We could have them come in there or down from there. And I would say not not to rate people or not to uh, chuck people. You know, Scarred people, but just find a number that each of us could advance 
and not with rankings or anything, just say each of us would advance three names or five names, and that would give us a big pool and there would be mutual at least common name, the names would be common among some of us. I assume, in other words, you're three of us, eight of us on the three, that's 24 names, but surely among the 24, there'd be additions, probably 24 persons. Three is too few, five. Just seems to me if we're going to do that thing, have them speak and be introduced to the public and be seen by us, we, ought, we maybe ought to wait until that point to begin to focus, yeah. narrow it down. Yeah, and I think we should talk in a minute about how we move candidates forward, but I just want to stay on the issue of who comes to speak next week. So I heard you say, Mr. Harkins, you'd like you're thinking maybe everyone should, so we're not eliminating anyone. Well, I'm just pointing out that if we don't do that, we do it because we didn't give somebody that we sure. don't know a chance. Now, President, did I hear you say two minutes, probably? Well, or, let's, I mean, we could do the math. We've got 18 of them, yeah, right? So. Yeah, that'd be 34 minutes if we gave them two minutes apiece. Right. For the eight, 18. Mm -hmm. Because Dr. Titus says. Okay. So, you know, that'd be roughly, now you're thinking about them coming up to the podium. I mean, it probably will take up a good 45 minutes, I would say, to get through them all. How does everyone feel about that? I agree with Mr. Harkins that we should hear from all of them because we don't want the public to think. We talked about being open mm -hmm. and we don't want the public to think, well, who did they shut out? Who didn't they shut out? introducing themselves will be the opportunity for the public as well as the board to see them. And I would want the board to be criticized of favoritism or this, that, the other. They need to be able to hear who's interested in representing them and their children. It's two minutes long enough though. I think so coupled with this, um, coupled with all the written, uh, you know. Uh -huh. I think they should have the opportunity to speak for themselves. I mean, their resumes speak for them, obviously, but it's a good opportunity to hear if they have anything that they additionally would like to add or anything that maybe we have, I mean, are we going to be asking them questions as well? Or, I mean, that I, I, I get the time. I, I, I mean, I think that's for the board to decide. My, my personal feeling is I do want to be somewhat cautious of time, um, but we, we can have that discussion as well. I appreciate that um, Mr. Brenneman reached out to several of the candidates to get some feedback as well. So he put the time and effort into that. And I suppose to that point, any of us could do that, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm hearing some general consensus around inviting them all to come and speak. Is that what I'm hearing from the board? Ms. Sheridan, you look... No, like you're I'm, not sure. I'm kind of perplexed because I didn't know that we could reach out to the candidates and call them and talk. Or I would have done that myself as Mr. Polito knows I'm kind of nosy. <laughs> I applaud you, Mr. Brennan, and I did not even know I could do that. I thought maybe I was going to break a, a rule or a law that said I couldn't do it. So... Maybe that should have been clarified to all of us. And I apologize. Perhaps we should have clarified that, Ms. Sheridan. Oh, you don't have to apologize. But I was a little taken back when he said he interviewed everybody. And I was like, whoa, can you do that? So are we all in agreement that everyone is invited to speak? And how do we feel about the time limit there? Mr. Nichols, would you like to propose an alternative time other well, than two we minutes? We this in three minutes, that's all. Ah. Um, I agree with you, it should be limited, but two minutes is all for sure. Three minutes? So we understand. What did city council do? Didn't they give them three minutes to go up and speak, introduce themselves? I did it, um, but I can't remember how long. It was very brief. It was literally right. like, was here's my name, here's why, and you sat down. So. I, but I don't recall the time. Did they ask questions? No. I can't recall. No questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm in agreement, three minutes. Madam President, yes, I move that we invite the 18 interested candidates and give them three minutes each to speak. Uh, second it. 
Well, at this point, we're just developing a All consensus. Right. We're not taking motions, um, but the, uh, the sentiment is registered. Yes, thank you for moving us forward there. Okay, so we are in agreement that we'll invite all 18 and we'll give them three minutes. So, Ms. Jones, you'll reach out to them with that information. Okay. About two minutes for questions per minute. I don't want to prolong it, but I just mean if someone naturally provokes a good question, I don't want to extend the time. I still want to leave that. I don't think we have time for questions. Okay. Okay. Jay raised his hand. Oh, thank you. Yes, Mr. Brenneman. Gosh, I have to get better. I just have a technical question, I guess. Um, has anybody verified that everybody is eligible to to be to fill this? Is there any, you know, not 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 you know, not eligible? Is everybody eligible? Isn't there there's one that still working at Pike for Burley? There's a couple. Yeah. So if you're if you're working for the district, yeah. I mean, I haven't sitting on top there. So if I, if I may comment on that, so section uh, 322 of the school code does prohibit any employee of the school district um, from being a school board member, but they could be a school board member up to the day, excuse me, they could be an employee up to the day that they are appointed. So it would, if you were to decide to move forward with that person, they would have the option to su submit their immediate resignation. Um, to that, Mr. Wachter, um, I, you know, looking over the resumes and speaking with them, I don't think there's anybody that's directly employed by the <laughs> district so much as they're working for an organization that's contracted with the organization. Is there any differences in, in applying that? And if this is a fact, can anybody communicate this to the applicants? Um, in clarification of that, if you are... Uh... And that's the case, Mr. Walker. This she's right. employed by Family Services. We just right. checked, so which, contracted at PB, which is good. Thank you. And I haven't seen any of the applications, mm -hmm. so I I don't know who is and who isn't. Um, but no, contractors are fine. Contractors okay. are fine. Okay. Right. Madam President, yes. What about the student who currently is that? Yeah. 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 I, is there any legal reasons why they couldn't serve on the board kind of assuming punt that to mr walker as well okay. is he 18. um there there's no prohibition against students there's practical concerns but there's not legal concerns okay thank you and he is that student is just 18 i believe yeah yeah so the requirement is being a citizen of the Commonwealth, having a good moral character and being 18 years of age or upwards and having been a resident of the district for at least one year prior to the date of appointment. Did we vet that? Does anyone, how do, vetting the year long residency requirement? I believe the requirements were included in the advertisement okay. that was sent out. So they were made aware of that. Um, we uh, the recommendation would be that we get that verified prior to them taking the oath or it's making it an appointment. So we're going to act under the assumption that they are eligible. Yes, and perhaps verify the residency requirement prior to the vote. Okay. Okay, Mr. Brenneman, does that satisfy your question? That was a good question. Clearly, we had to work through a few things there. Yeah, no, that's a question I had I had because I I did notice that there's a number there's a number of applicants who uh, are work for a contracted aid, a organization that's contracted with the district, not just the one. So I just I just want a clarification on that. And um, of course, you know I think if if there's no conflict with that, it's just probably as simple if if any of them were picked, recusing themselves from certain uh, votes, like you know you and Ms. Gillespie and others who maybe have that. But um, I. I think every single one of them has been in the district for more than a year. So I, yeah. I think we're at least good in that part. Great, thank you. Okay, so let's assume then um, they'll all come to the meeting next week and they'll all speak for their three minutes. Now, how will what will we do next is the next question. Um, so if you look at the discussion points that we put down there, um, I'm at item number three then. 
Um, we could at that point each put forward our top candidates. Mr. Harkins, that's kind of what you just said. So each of us could write down our top three or our top five or whatever number we want. We would write them down, give them to Ms. Jones. I think Mr. Walker, she would read each of them. Am I correct? Because that all needs to be public. And then she would tell us which names appeared on more than one of our lists. So, you know, if if I write down Jane Doe and so does Ms. Sheridan, then Jane Doe moves on because Jane Doe got two votes, essentially. So that might help us limit the, the pool to at least get a group of finalists. Do we like do we like that idea? Does that sound like it makes sense to yes, folks? I like that simpler approach than that one and two approach. Okay, we'll get there in a second. But okay, so that's how we'll we'll narrow our candidates. Then we'll all write down. Do we want to do our top three or our top five or our top two? What do we want to do? That's after we hear them. After we hear them. I do have just one question. If someone's married to an employee, would that be? That is not a disqualifier. Okay. So we're going to write down our top choices. What? How many? Our top two, our top three, our top five, our top ten. What do we want to do? Personally, I like the top five. That way we can come to a consensus or, percent, attend, or potentially go into executive session after everybody has. No, we're, no. we have to do this all public. Okay. Right. Just wanted to double check. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I heard you say top five. Yeah. Okay. Did I hear someone else? I like three. Mr. I would Harkins. like top three. I like two or more. Okay, Ms. Pickens said three. Mr. Harkins said three. Mr. Nichols, what did you say? Two or more. Two or more. Yeah. So you could live with three. Ms. Sheridan? Three. Three. Do you have a thought, Ms. Cooley? Three Okay, Mr. Brenneman, do you have a thought there? I, I would prefer to just because I, I imagine the length of time it's going to take to read, you know, eight members times three uh, and to go through that. I'd be, I'd, I personally, just for time, and because I, I think if we know who our top two are, I think that that's um, pretty good. But uh, if you know, I'll go with whatever the majority goes with. Okay. Sounded like we had a lot of consensus around three. So. And if we have a tie for three, if we could out of eight, uh, we could. Yeah. Um, then we'd have four or something. So can everyone live with our top three? Okay. Yeah. Maybe whatever number we come up with doesn't have to be considered okay. votes. But if they rise to the top, and it's obvious to us who's got support. Great. Yes, I, I think if we each put forward our top three, I think I hope, hope there will be some that rise to the top. So, Mr. Walker, how will we do that? Will we? as I said, write them down or ranking or whatever, but then will Ms. Jones read each of, you know, Ms. Devlin's top three, or will we read them? What, how will we do that? I think for purposes of uh, efficiency, I'm, I'm looking at smarter people than I, um, there'd probably be a way to throw a spreadsheet up on the computer and the names as they're read out could be dropped in and the top three could bubble to the top. Okay, great. But each of our choices has to be read aloud. Am I correct? That has to be public. I can't yes. just write my three down and slide them over to Mr. That is correct. Any document you would do that on and, and slide those over would be subject to right to know. So we might as well just read them. Okay. Could I just, yes, Mr. Harkins. Could I just disagree respectfully just to try to explain my reason for that? If we if we wrote three names down and shuffled them down and then they were tallied, Angela has the names who I see, and the spreadsheet has Jane Doe, 13, 6, whatever the numbers are, then at some point we have a, we, and when we've narrowed down, we have a vote between one or two of them, and that's absolutely going to be done. I'm not sure that we, what, are, what will we be getting away with if we uh, wrote down the names? And, and I'm trying, one of the things I'm looking for is simultaneousness to it. So there's two separate things. Mm. If we if we go down the row and state our pre our preferences or write down our names, I think there's something better for having Angela assemble them and collate them at once rather than us doing it. It's a matter of process. Well, so I'm just saying, do we really have to? Uh, be careful about 
writing down or advancing the three names we would choose because at that point it doesn't matter. It matters when we have to be serious to vote for or against someone. But how we arrive at the narrow pool that was. So, so Mr. Harkins, I would I would say if your concern, if I may summarize it or rephrase it, if your concern is you wouldn't let want one person's indication of who their top three to influence another person's by discussing it out loud and yeah. reading the room, yeah. then maybe putting them on paper and shifting them over to Mr. Jones would be fine. And, and that way it's all done by the time that we say which way they've gone. Okay. And at some point, we have to take action. And of course, all of us have to Correct. Right. That, 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 I think, is a very salient comment regarding that process. Mr. Polito has something to add. If we really wanted to expedite it, we could probably build a spreadsheet and give each board member a laptop and they could put their names in. <laughs> that would be the quickest way to do it rather than have. How does the board feel about that? I mean, I, I don't know how much longer it's going to take us to just jot our names down, but. The easiest way possible. Okay, so maybe we can think about that piece of the process. What we've decided is we're going to put forward our top three folks, right? And then we'll come back to you with exactly how we're going to do that electronically or on paper. So let's say now we have our, our, we each have our top three and they've been collated and we've got a couple hopefully that rose to the top. Um, now, how do we want to move forward? So do we want to talk there about the finalists? Do we want to pause and have discussion? Like I'm going to say, here's why I like Jane Doe and she's in my top, or do we want to just keep moving forward? That's my first question. I'd say we just vote. Mr. Nichols said to vote, Mr. Harkins. Or talk. Or at that point, say, well, here's the situation. It's been this or that. It will have been narrowed, so we don't have to do this. It's going to be a complex thing. It can be just this vote now, or this. Uh, you know, how does everyone? We can just that. You could just ask that question then. How does everyone want to proceed from that point? So we'll we'll have the opportunity if people if if someone wants to speak at that point, they can just kind of say, you know, Ms. Devlin, we want to. We'll say something, otherwise we'll just move right to voting. I'm fine with that, remaining flexible. Okay, okay. All right, so now let's say we have our, our small pool. How are we going to vote on them? Um, so I'm at number five on your sheet here. So we could just start voting. You know, the, the person that received the most number was on the most of our list as a finalist. We could nominate that person and we can all vote yay or nay like we do at a reorganization meeting. Um, I've heard some concern about that. Like, I don't really wanna vote no against this person who put their name out there. So that's a thought. Um, the other alternative and Mr. Nichols, where you said about the ones and twos, I stole this from Michigan's Public School Association, um, um, School Board Association. They did this. They said each board member lists their first and second choice. The top choice would receive two vote, two points. Your second choice would receive one point, and then we just tally it up, and the numbers tell the story. So that's advanced math. We want to really expose ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems numerical. So we so what would end up happening there is one person would have the most points, and then we would just nominate that person and vote on them. It saves us from voting on multiple folks. Just a suggestion. Well, again, I don't think we have to lock ourselves into something at this point, and we'll have the opportunity that night, that time, once they're once they're spoken, we can react at that point because it would be easier for all of us to prepare for next week's meeting to have all that set up ahead of time otherwise we're we're going back and trying to build out some type of voting tally spreadsheet to, to do this in a while yeah, and, and I hope I, I don't I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here. I just want to be prepared because I feel like I don't want us to look to be frank, I don't want us to look stupid. I want us to look like we know what we're doing here. Um, 
So yes, Mr. Harkins, I do hear you. And I, I think we should have some flexibility, but I would like to have a structure that we think we're gonna follow. Um, do we like the points option or do we just wanna start voting on our finalists? Where is everyone on that? I like the points, Madam President. Mr. Brenneman likes points. I do too. Ms. Sheridan points does sound. as well. Ms. Cooley does as well. Points sound good. Ms. Pickens, do you have a thought? No. Open either way, if we have points or if we just go to vote. So whatever the majority goes with, I can go with. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, then let's try to do the point system. Okay, so that means then, Angela, do you have that ballot? Did you bring the ballot? No. So um, I did have copies of it. Okay, so Angela will prepare a document. It will have all of the... And Listen, I can work out how all the voting okay. tallies and all of that will great. occur. So Prior to you that. don't have to worry about that. Okay, okay great. Prior so to the Madam President, can we invite um, Shane Dexter, who's the senior at Collegiate Academy, to come on board as a youth board member? So maybe he will like to do that and eliminate that because I'm sure he has plans to go to college. I don't know if it's local, but I would hate to have him maybe get points and then mm, we're doing this all over again. Mm -hmm. So maybe ask him to remove himself and serve the rest of the year as a youth board member. One of the youth board members. Mm -hmm. We should have somebody from Mary High as well. Well, I think in the past it was rotated. Am I right? So like a month and a month yes. or something like that, right? Two months. Two months. So. Okay. Okay. I know, Ms. Sheridan, you had said that. I, yeah. I like that idea too. I think that makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I also think Mr. Brenneman mentioned to me that he, Mr. Dexter, I think is being inducted into the National Honor Society that night. So he probably couldn't come to the meeting anyway. So, you know, being in high school, he has another schedule. Right. So yes. Um, so Ms. Jones, maybe you could reach out to him and let him know, you know, we, we'd like to put him on as a, as a student representative for two, months. for two months and see if he'd be amenable to that. And then we'll kind of take him out of the rest of the process if he's amenable. Okay. So then let's assume we've all tallied and we come up with our person that has, let's hope somebody has the most numbers. We don't have a tie. Um, we'll nominate that. We'll, I'll ask someone to nominate that person, get a second, we'll do the vote and then they'll be immediately sworn in. Okay. Um, and then just to wrap up there, I think all candidates should receive a letter of thanks from the board office when we're completed. And then I know Ms. Jones had questions about where we wanna do this on the agenda. So she has indicated one option is we could do the speeches um, at the conclusion of the board business, or another option would be to do kind of all of this before the Stair Climber Awards when there's a larger audience. Um, where do we wanna put this on the agenda? I think somewhere late in the meeting is better than early. Mr. Brenneman raised his hand. Thank you, Don. Yes, Mr. Brenneman. I think it would be if we had an efficient, timely, you know, approach to this. I part of me is like this would be really awesome for the kids and others who are there to see a new board member get selected and sworn in, and then that board member to participate in the rest of the activities of the board. I just think that would be really awesome. Um, but at the same time, I don't, you know, again, it all comes down to the time. If it's something that's efficient and we're able to do within a reasonable amount of time, I think we should front load it. Otherwise, I would suggest moving it, um, you know, further back in, in the meeting. Well, even if we're efficient, if we have, we're going to be an hour doing it. I think that's unfair to those grade school kids that are coming in for the report. Yes, yes. The only issue with having them sworn in and taking a seat prior to business is that they don't have privy to board docs. They don't, they haven't reviewed any of the items. They really wouldn't be able to vote because they don't have access to the information. Okay, thank you. Mr. Polito, were you gonna say something? I, I just wanted to mention that we had tried in the past to do presentations when the stair climbers were there and a couple of them won 20 minutes or, or even longer. and who became very antsy during that. And I think probably about five to 10 minutes of presentations is all we could, could handle with the, all the students in the audience. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I think, you know, if it was just the voting part, we probably could do that efficiently. Now that we've, you know, beaten it to death, Mr. Brenneman, we probably could do that. But I think the hour of speaking that we've all agreed on might be too much for the students in the room. Um, okay. Yeah, again, just wishful thinking, that's all. <laughs> but as a parent with three little ones, I know I would not be able to keep them that long. Yeah. Mr. Harkins, do you want to? The most important conversation for these applicants is to us, to us to uh, learn about them, evaluate them, and judge them. And for that, because of what Angela pointed out, that should be after our business is done at some point later in the meeting. Those that are interested might stick around out of interest. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I don't think we should assume that people want to get the hell out of there. So we should all like the citizens. I think it would be a good exercise in civics and public affairs to have, it, have a full meeting like that. But there's another possibility is to not make the vote that night after we've heard from them and want to have questions about it. You can have a special meeting. I don't want to prolong it. I'm just trying to point out a few things to consider. So if someone being a devil's advocate, there's just, a, it just my leaning is late in the meeting. It, it, on our business, and then if we do get somebody that in there, and they're smart, they're not on the spot or expected to deal with things that they're not right, they're ill equipped to do that. And they'll get a taste of what I'm eating. <laughs> so it sounds like, oh, yes, Ms. Peckins. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, is there any way that we can do it during the? Uh, um, I'm sorry, my brain just went blank. When we have the community speak, can we have them go after that? And then that way, whoever it is, they gotta, you know, they can stay around for the rest of the meeting and all of that. So, so your suggestion is this, they speak at the time of the, when the community speaks, but maybe we hold the voting part to the end? Mm hmm Could do that very beginning but then that's keeping the kids there you isn't the public comment after the stair climber oh, yes directly after yeah. oh, okay. okay i'm seeing a lot of head nods on that okay miss jones how does that sound for the agenda then okay 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 so i think we're all clear um we will i'll work with miss jones to put together an updated document like this so everybody knows what we're doing we'll work to to inform the candidates of what they can expect and when to show up and all of that. Any other questions or comments on this agenda item before we move on? Uh, Madam President, I just yes. want to say that uh, you expertly navigated this. I'm really impressed by everybody's uh, input on this. So I I think this is worth celebrating that we made it seem so uh, uh, you know well well thought out, well done. Thank you. And now we will be the model for City Council as they go through the process. Yes, we will. They can watch and learn. Congratulations at 11 o'clock Wednesday when we're still talking about Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Appreciate that. Put a pound thing. Put a pound there somewhere. Okay, then we will move on to our next item. Thank you all for your patience with that conversation. We will move on. Uh, item three, Black History Month. We have a presentation by Mr. Nixon and Ms. Irwin. Hey, good evening, everyone. Excitedly, it is February. It is uh, February's closing in real soon, which tells us it's Black History Month. It gives us the opportunity to honor, bring awareness, and celebrate Black history and Black culture. So, what we wanted to do is just kind of take you through our Black History page. Oh, sorry. We're good. Okay. What we want to do is take you through our Black History page. Um, just kind of talk about some certain points. Um, Eric and I worked together with Johnny Johnson and, and basically came up with this for you. Uh, so to start off, uh, we are going to replicate what we did last year. Uh, last year, we did short biographies and posters that were sent out to the schools uh, a week in advance. Um, so every week, there was a specific theme that came out underneath um, subject areas or topics. So this year's theme is going to be trailblazers and beneficiaries. And the weeks are going to be week one would be language and literature. Week two would be STEM. Week three will be arts and music. And week four will be social studies and politics. 
And so what we're going to do again is we're going to do we will push the short biographies out. Uh, the administrators uh, will will read these off to the schools, so it'll, it'll definitely hit the school community and, and even further make make an impact in the classrooms when they're reading these biographies. And then the posters uh, will be put out by our print shop, and they will be in a highly visible area in the school for all all to see and to um, identify and bring awareness to. So as Ken mentioned, the theme this year is trailblazers and beneficiaries. And so uh, we'll present um, one trailblazer and one beneficiary each week through those posters that Ken mentioned and through the biographies. But we know that what we really wanna do is make the connection between our past and what's happening today and our future. And we're gonna do that in the classroom uh, with these the, the focus on particular subjects as Ken mentioned each week. Um, so what we're at, just to expand on that a little bit, what we're asking um, each school to do is to design an activity uh, that week. Um, the first week is uh, language and literature um, and what we found was really effective and fun and interesting last year was asking the schools to submit uh, an actual artifact that, of, of the work that they were doing. And um, when you get a moment, if you haven't already, please check out uh, the website where um, those artifacts are, are from last year are included. If you click on any of those, um, you'll, you'll see examples of the work that our students did last year. Um, it's a way to show the, the students and the community that this celebration isn't just talk, that we're actually learning and producing and uh, asking students to apply what they've learned um, uh, on each of those weeks. So we're really excited about that. That will again be housed and updated um, weekly on, on this website. This obviously is the, the 2002 um, artifacts that you're looking at, but I think we were all really kind of blown away by some of the variety of the work that the students were doing um, and the creativity, not just in like the art and music realm, but applying that to all of the different subjects. Um, got a lot of engagement too when we shared this these examples of, of this work. Um, on, on our social media platforms as well. So um, that, that's the part that was really effective last year that we're gonna, gonna replicate. And also uh, I'd be remiss to, to not present, uh, speak on behalf of somebody else. Mrs. Sherry Prater was part of this as well. She had a lot of influence and in, insight into this, this uh, building this program out. So I don't wanna leave her out. Actually it was her, her idea to do the trailblazers and the beneficiaries. So it's much appreciated. Uh, so the other part I'm going to talk to you about is the resources. So if you look right here, and then we're intentionally showing you this page. And again, this page is housed right now at eresd.org forward slash black history. Um, but there'll be a, a highlight that I'll share with you and another easier way to find it when we're, when we're wrapping up here. Um, so on this Black History Month resources page, we're going to add on Johnny Johnson gave us a few new resources. So underneath this area, we'll also add on uh, what's called sharedheritage.org. And we'll also add on uh, BurleyLegacyAlliance.org. That's just a couple of the ones that he he did share with us. Um, also, it's going a little slower, but also we're, we're, we're proud to um, share with you that in direct response to um, Director Brenneman's request and the school board resolution around uh, making a Black History site that would be ongoing and, and always refreshing. Uh, we are going to add a, a referral site, a referral page. Um, so now when you look under the trailblazers and change makers and you click on that and you scroll down here, um, this gives the, the community as well as folks that have represented, um, you know, uh, done a lot, made our, our own local trailblazers in Erie uh, have the ability to be referred now at, at, at the ability of just doing an email. So folks that may have lived in Erie, taught in Erie, uh, worked in Erie, or just made an impact that may be living elsewhere, elsewise, now folks can, can directly email them to us so we can keep this page um, ongoing and continuous. And so just a couple of the names I'm just gonna share so you can see real quick. Name up there. Oh. Sorry. 
So um, in addition, and this is kind of the, the, um, the newest thing that we're bringing to the table this year is with the help of Don and our IMD team here at the district, um, we're going to be producing a series of videos around Black History Month um, uh, in which we interview several people. Um, we're going to have produce about a video a week um, hearing from highlighting uh, the different perspectives of uh, people who can speak to, uh, again, our past, present, and future. We've already um, filmed a few of these, a couple of these videos. The first is an interview with Johnny Johnson, who talks a lot about um, our history as a district and the um, kind of those pioneering first Black educators who helped pave the way uh, to where we are. Um, this, Mr. Nixon has a video in which he talks about um, our current diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Um, you can also look forward to interviews with um, an alum and a current teacher or administrator. So all through different lenses, um, speaking about um, the role, the importance, um, and the accomplishments of Black educators specifically um, to our district and to the community as a whole. We'll uh, launch those videos um, at the beginning of the month, one a week. Um, they'll be shared on this page um, and also all of our uh, platforms, including our YouTube channel. Thank you. So we do have this at the lower end, celebrating Black history all year, year. it's a direct link to WQLN's Black Culture page, which is which is a very vast and in-depth page that talks about Black culture. So I definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, in addition to that, uh, the again, the, the page has been um, on the forward slash Black History off of the website, but um, you know, knowing that we have the opportunity to now house it at the on the actual diversity, equity, and inclusion page. So if you go to the page here now, Oops, my mouse has just jumped a little bit. Hang on, you got me. I don't know why. Thank you. So now on the, the diversity, equity, inclusion page, you can see right down in the, the index on this side, it's working out um, that we have all these different resources um, where we'll, we'll house our celebrating Black History page here on this on this website, on this part of the school district website. So just excited about, again, excited about the opportunity to bring awareness and, and, and to Black culture, Black African American culture, and then um, knowing that we have this house on this page, um, it'll be an ongoing uh, resource for our community. Is there any other questions to answer or speak to? Will we be um, highlighting when it's Hispanic American Month, when it's Native American, we will be highlighting the same. Yeah, I, could, I can speak to that directly. So um, a couple of years ago, we actually had the Gold Four team when we were in the thick of the, the beginning work of the strategic plan. And uh, the Gold Four team itself actually came up with, um, in looking at a couple of different university um, celebrate monthly celebration calendars and then talking to equity leaders across the state, we actually have uh, compiled a list of um, specific celebrations that we'll highlight. And so Erica, you know, her and I, we kind of work together just making sure that the banner and those are typically housed on the banner. So we do want to make sure that the banner will uh, speak about, uh, you know, Hispanic American Heritage Month, um, LGBTQI Pride Month, you know, those types of things will be highlighted on that banner. Um, and then just, just at a more in-depth level will be the Black History page itself. I would like to submit this to you, excuse me. His name is Mr. William Hurd. He's a hundred years old. He still lives on his own. He drives. And I'm just thinking about him due to history in the city of Erie. He served in the military. So there's that's history. He's 100 years old. He's very sharp. He's very vibrant. He had a job at the post office. I've known him since the 50s. <laughs> he had a job at the post office. And uh, they were astounded he didn't have a criminal record. And they had to hire him. You know, way back, but he always was very industrious, and mm -hmm. he's now 100, and I've known him for a long time. Do you have Earl Lawrence on that? I, I saw Ada. 
Earl would be her dad. He was a music teacher out in Fairview, couldn't get a job, I imagine, in the city at that time. Uh, is, is he on your list? Uh, he was my drum teacher in 1964, and he was about 80 then. Well, we take your time. Before your time. Yeah. Johnny Johnson had to be able to go Yeah, if you want him. Yeah, Earl is a great guy. Yeah, I can reach out. I'll reach out to Johnny Johnson to make sure we get go along. He's a winner. So the goal here is just to show again what students are doing in the classroom help build that awareness and just do it in a way that's engaging through the videos and that will live on um, through the website so um, and we know that some of the individual schools are also doing uh, some supplementary um, recognition or events I and mean, we would absolutely highlight those as well as they come up, but we felt it was important again to do this kind of district-wide unified um, recognition. So, I, think it's, I think it's working. I, I was concerned when we changed all our textbooks, you, you know, <laughs> Columbus didn't discover America. It was already here, there were people here. And, and I was I thought with those new textbooks that we would be having people to show up in meetings like they have in other states. And we haven't had any problem with that. I think it's good to have to reflects well on our culture and our school. People are tolerant of one another as they should be. Other questions for Erica and Ken before they go? We're going to go on. Thank you. My list. Oh, you have a, he has a paper <laughs> referral <laughs> coming down. No problem. More on that. Secret list. I, I just want to say that I love that this is local focus. I think with Black History Month, you know, we could just do the same old stuff that everybody does and we could talk about Rosa Parks and we should, but like the local focus, I'm sure much driven by Mr. Johnson, which I do appreciate is fantastic. I love that. Yeah, we, we know people are not turning to our website and our social media to uh, as the primary source of information right. about a Rosa Parks, but what they can't find anywhere else and what we should be doing and what we're attempting to do with this website is bring exactly what you said, the local focus, local information, um, the people who have really had a, a hands-on part of building this district and continuing to help it succeed today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. names may already be on there. I thought I might have seen them in the group, but there was couple of people that if Johnny's involved, he's probably gonna involve it just in case somebody got over by the by the way. You can see it here. Thank you. We welcome the input. It, the list is not at all exhaustive, which is why we're asking people to continue to submit names. Thanks. Thank you. Before we move on to the next item, I just do want to recognize Miss Ewell, who I noticed came in um, one of our applicants for the vacancy seat. So I just want to make sure everyone is aware that she is here today. Okay, let's move on to item number four, 23-24 budget. Mr. Polito. Uh, yes, it's uh, officially budget season now. We have uh, a deadline of January 26 to either adopt a resolution saying we aren't going to go over our Act 1 index or move ahead with the early budget process so that we can put a referendum question on the May primary to, to go above that index. Um, given that the this year our Act 1 index is 6.2%, we did move ahead and put that on as a recommendation to not exceed the index for next week's meeting, but I did want to allow the board some time to discuss if, if there was any discussion regarding that. Well, 6.2 would be less than the inflation rate in last year, but with the new contract we have in place and such, it, it, I don't have a problem with it. I... Anyone else? Go for it. I certainly have no issue with that as well. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Polito on that one? Okay. Thanks, Mr. Polito. We'll move on to item five of the facilities plan, Mr. Brockman. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, so at your table and online, uh, there are two documents that go along with agenda item, this agenda item, excuse me. The first one that we'll discuss is the uh, table that is in front of you. Um, 
as I know Mr. Harkins is aware, uh, at some point before the, more or less around the Thanksgiving holiday, uh, we looked at a couple of, at least one option for um, replacing the existing lights that light up the facade of Collegiate Academy. Uh, so prior to the first construction project that we did there, there were lights that ran along the railing. Uh, obviously with all the work that we put in, we were not going to go ahead and recommend drilling holes back into the marble and the uh, concrete stone that we just replaced. But we definitely want to make sure that we're highlighting that side of the building and really brighten it up. And so we, uh, in front of you, you'll see three different options. That's uh, that top chart uh, for lighting options. So the first option, uh, and with all of these options, essentially the plan is that they will put new holes which sit in the stadium and extend up from the corner of the concession stands. And they're utilizing LED lights that will sit on top of the light posts. And when we did this at the demonstration, uh, when we angled it, one of these lights lit up half of the building. And I know Mr. Harkins can talk to you, but uh, we'll talk also about how well it, it looked. Um, so the three options that we have in front of us, uh, the option one is basically installing the lights that we viewed on that day, which would be white LED, and it would just light up the side of Collegiate Academy in, in white, and that would be on during night. Um, there are two other options that are there, and they will basically means that instead of just having white lights, we can program them to be any color that we want. So if Erie High is playing a football game at night and we want to light up the building purple and gold, we can do that. Um, from what the architects have told me, obviously they don't have a preference between white or the, the colored options, the program colored option. They did indicate that option two, if we are going to go with the programming one, is a better option than option three. Because of, because of the manufacturer type. Yeah, and it, it's more about on the programming side than okay. it is on the wattage. I, I, all of these are going to be LEDs, and so the the amount of draw that it's going to have electric electricity wise, it's it's not really going to make that big of a difference if we go with the whites or we go with the colors. I've seen our Christmas frenetic Christmas to play display up at Erie High, so Legion needs something to have a chance to compete with that. <laughs> they, they do quite a job up at Erie High. I think it's a good idea. The visibility of that building is pretty good, right? To the it is. And and it would be as you drive up State Street, you, you can imagine you will be able to see the entire face of that building as you drive up State Street. And if we can throw up purple and gold, maybe people don't notice that a third of the lights are out on the scoreboard, things like that. <laughs> okay. Mr. I like Harkins? the color oh. option. I like the color option. You like the color option. Mr. Harkins? Two things. At a mid-football mid season, Sumner came here after attending a game and was concerned about the lighting in the concession stand mm -hmm. area, horseshoe. And so that night I was there with, uh, I expressed that concern. And it seemed to me that the, the contractor said they would put a pole on either side of the concession stand with a fixture aimed at the school. Yep. But there would be flexible uh, fixtures that could be put and aimed downward from those poles onto the mm -hmm. front of the concession stand to light up that area, which is a safety concern. Mm -hmm. So I guess whatever we do, I think that something that matters to me. And I think it would sound there to have that option to have adjustable lighting in the area of the concession stand. Yes. Uh, the other thing that I am investigating with the electrical contract that is doing the work at Collegiate is to actually put in new can lights on the apron part of the concession stand so that when you're underneath that canopy, there's lights that shine down. Right now, there is nothing there. And so right at the concession area, we just have wall packs that are LED that are on the side of the building. But I think to help out with that also, if we can put lights in the ceiling, the apron part, Showing down, that would also assist. Both would be important for me. Yep. Anyone else have any kind of preference or guidance for Mr. Brockman on this question of lighting? 
they want some direction, I imagine. Uh, yes. So at this point, I'll go back to what after I get direction here, then I can get a formal change order uh, created, and then that would be voted on next month at the February meeting. So I guess my question is always, do we have the money? I mean, what, how does this fit into everything here? I think if Mr. Brockman goes through the rest of this, you can see at the bottom of the spreadsheet that there's a series of change orders on Erie High. And uh, and will send that net out to a million dollars in savings. So it will be it will more than offset the lighting. Um, and then he also has two recommendations on paving that we'd like to use a portion of that savings to expedite as well. Thank you, Mr. Polito. Um, so uh, I know that many of you know what the condition of the parking lot right outside of Joanna Connell looks like. Uh, as well as if anybody has been to the service center as well as the condition of that parking lot. Um, what we did is we went forward and I spoke with the uh, Thomas Construction that is doing the work up at Erie High. Uh, they're doing a lot of paving work with us through the uh, projects that we have at Erie High. And so these are the two numbers that I got from them to fully mill down, which is take it down to the base level repair what's underneath, and then pour brand new asphalt in front of Joanna Connell would be about $123,000. And as well as the service center, same basic process, that's about three hundred and fifty. Um, I'm looking to get some kind of direction now so that we can get these change orders also put on for February so that once the weather breaks, we can get on the schedule to have both of these areas repaired as soon as possible. Um, and as Mr. Polito indicated, the bottom chart are all of the change orders that are actually on the agenda for next week for approval. Um, you'll see some doubling. So Thomas Construction is for phase one and for phase two. What we found is that the phase one project is close enough to its conclusion, and there are still some items that are outstanding. Uh, to make life easier on us, as well as on the contractors, what we're planning on doing is basically taking any of the unfinished work and transferring it from the first project to the second project. Um, you'll notice that for the most part, most of these are pretty much close to um, equal. So the, the deduct for Thomas Construction is 582,000. The ad is 504,000. The difference there and why we're getting such a big credit back is all of the unused unit costs that are embedded into the contracts that we have. Um, when we signed the contract with RAVE for the phase one project, there's uh, about $900,000 worth of unit costs built into that contract, which are used for unforeseen conditions, additional work that we need to do. Well, the phase one project went along so well that we really didn't have to use any of those dollars, which is why we're getting all of that back as a credit. The front lot at Connell, just so we're talking the same thing, that's what I'd call, I had called the drive through drop off. Correct. Pickup. That's unsafe to walk on. Correct. And I'm glad to see us doing it, but it's occurred to me because I've seen it a lot and I walk through there sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it just seems like there might be a drainage problem on the north half of it because it just seems like the whole okay. north half of it is disaster. Mm -hmm. If we just remill and we pave, is there an underlying drainage still? Once we mill down and we get to the base level, we'll be able to put eyes on what the drainage is. And if we do need to make an a, a we have to adapt at that point, then we'll adapt at that point. Just so we don't make it look nice for a year or two and have it collapse again. Correct. I mean, and the truth is that that's essentially what we've been doing the past couple of years. We'll coal patch it or we'll just put a temporary patch on. And at this point, both the service center and Joanna Connell have gone beyond what those individual patches can do. Uh, I mean, we put coal patch down, the first heavy snow, the snow plows come through, it rips up everything that we put down. Does the service center have some concrete driveways? Because there must be a lot of truck traffic there as long as the schools. Uh, there is concrete aprons. Outside of that, everything is asphalt. Mm -hmm. Brown down asphalt. Brown down asphalt. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anyone else have questions for Mr. Brockman about these items? Um, the back lot, Madam President. Yes. 
Can I address him? Sure. Uh, the back lot, um, you're thinking of the runway through the front. Correct. The back parking lot is okay? Yes. The side, I mean. Yes. Okay. All right. So is everyone okay with the, I mean, obviously the change orders that Mr. Brockman mentioned are already on our agenda for January. Do we, do we have enough consensus to give him the go ahead to move forward with the paving? And then also where do we want to be on the options for lighting? It sounds like the money will shake out. So I heard you say the option two, the is good better, option better. two works. So I saw a head nod from Ms. Gillespie as well. And option two gives you the flexibility of moving the fixtures yep. on that pole. Yes, sir. Okay. So you're okay with that, yes. Mr. Harkins? Yes. Anyone opposed to that option too? Give me a head shake. Okay. Okay, Mr. Brockman, you're good? I'm good. Since, uh, we're, since we're talking, I would like to add, always Jefferson always looks so bad because of the snow plow. And I drove by there the other day again, and I know it's fixed at the end of the season, but we go the entire winter and it just looks atrocious. So just wanted to raise that again. I know you're aware. Thanks. Yes. Uh, the last item on this agenda item, or the last part of this agenda item is uh, a very sneak preview of what the new Edison is going to look like. This drawing is from December 15th. It is already changed in a very small way, but at this point, this is essentially what the um, actual plan is going to look like. Uh, now, at the February 1st committee of the whole, we plan on bringing the architects in to go through the full rendition of what it's going to look like. At that point, you'll see renderings, you'll see elevations of what the outside is, is going to look like. You'll see some renderings of what the inside is going to look like in certain areas. Um, so we'll just, and I'll try to go through this quickly. On that first page, this is the site plan. If you look to what is the left side of the picture, you'll see an outline of where the current building is. Obviously, the proposal is to put this in that grassy area that is behind the current building. Um, the idea behind the building is that we're, they, the, the architects designed it to have this pod system. And so the first floor and the second floor kind of mirror each other as far as what we're, we're, you have. Um, I will note that this is probably the sixth iteration of this. We've had four individual meetings with the Edison teachers and administration and solicited their feedback on what they would like to see in the building. Um, as a result of how many individuals' uh, parents are actually drivers there, uh, they you can see that there is a nice parent loop that goes around the back side of the building as well as in front of the building. Uh, the idea being, let's take traffic off of Bacon, let's take traffic off of East Lake Road, and let's try to create a better way for them to pick up their children. If we want to turn the page to the first floor. Mr. Uh, Brockman, hold on one second. Mr. Brenneman, did you have a, I, I missed your hand. Was it about the last item or are you okay to hold until the end of the Edison? Oh, you're muted. Uh, I can hold till whenever, but it will be strictly about the first page of the Edison part. So whatever. Okay. Let's take whatever your question now then, please. Um, okay. So uh, one, I, I know I mentioned this before, but I think it would be great to be able to preserve uh, one or two of the arches that go into the, the the building. I think those are beautiful arches. I know there's a school in Mill Creek and, and other buildings in the region that have preserved them as a park feature, as a... Um, uh, you know, archway near or over a walkway, whatever it might be, I think it would be really good for historical purposes because those those are really tremendous uh, architectural pieces for uh, otherwise could consider a, a haphazardly put together building. Um, the uh, a couple other things. So I'm looking at this. I'm trying to think about if, if anybody's ever heard of things called desire paths. And if you've ever been to a university you'll see how like walkways are designed differently than where you see pretty much everywhere else um, because they tend to put sidewalks and pat and pavers where students walk, where they are going to go, where they desire to go. And I'm looking at this and I'm seeing some disconnection. I'm guessing those yellow blocks are sidewalks. And I'm looking at the, the area where the parking space is towards where the school, the old school would stand. 
And I see there's no connection between those sidewalks around the parking lot and the actual sidewalks around. And I'm also wondering, like, for those who are coming straight out the back, are they going to just walk across the grass, cut across the, the traffic line there through the trees, whatever? That's one question I have about actually connecting those sidewalks. So the students and people are going to walk through it. They will. Um, the, the other one is that the it looks like on the right side, um, forgive me for not remembering the street there, um, but there it looks like a, a main entry type because it's like a it's kind of like the entry of, of, of Erie High where it's got like that kind of courtyard feel or whatever, the larger paved area. It just sort of dumps there. And I'm, I'm wondering about, um, since it is sort of a, it looks to me, it, it might not be, but it looks to me like an entrance. And if that's the entrance, I would imagine that kids and people are going to want to to cross there and to step there. And so I'm wondering, you know, maybe we should consider, you know, asking or looking what it might look like to actually have a um, a pathway across, you know, a paint, a paint or whatever across the street. Thankfully, it doesn't line up with that person's driveway. But, you know, if, if somebody is in a wheelchair, uh, a walker like I use or, you know, is is just walking your kids and you're worried about traffic, um, uh, you know, and I know this is just paint, but, you know, again, right there in the front where those entries and exits to the pave, the parking lots, there should, there should be some marked, uh, especially at the end of the bus loop, there should be some marked crosswalks because uh, those are the most dangerous parts for pedestrians um, and people, because there's sidewalks there, they're going to want to cross there and they could hit by, could get hit by a vehicle. Um, so I guess I'm just, asking for further consideration about how people will actually use the space uh, and move across the space along with, you know, going to uh, across the street or wherever back and forth. So those are, that's it for me. Okay. Noted, Mr. Yep. Brockman. Yep. Okay, Very great. So. Thanks, Mr. Brockman. Yep. Um, where was I? Uh, so if we, yes, thank you. If we turn the page, then this is that first floor, um, layout and uh for reference obviously um mr brenneman is correct the, the main entrance would be essentially located at the top right corner of this picture um the ground floor would be comprised of our pre-k classroom our kindergarten first and second grade pods uh, along with the gym a library uh, uh steam area the office area, as well as uh, the cafeteria and the kitchen um, and the mechanical room and all the other things that schools have. Um, the entrance, is, the plan is to have a very big kind of like the grand staircase, a little bit of an open feel to it. And, and you'll see more pictures on the first when we get to the rendering. Uh, but that would lead up to the second floor, the second floor much like the first floor is still potted, this would be their third or fourth and our fifth grade classrooms, um, as well as the uh, additional spaces and classrooms that are there. I will note, and I should have said it when we were on the first floor, that right now Edison has a pantry that is located in a trailer off the back of the building. This will take the pantry and put it inside the building proper. Uh, part of the design is that it will have its own entrance so that during those events, parents, students can enter into a doorway, which will lead them into a vestibule where the only place to go is the pantry. And unless there's any questions, I don't want to take up too much time with this because we are going to get a much more in-depth preview next uh, at the next committee of the whole meeting. Sure. Yes. Um, what's exactly in the courtyard? As of right now, it's question mark. So we were looking to have some kind of an uh, exterior learning space. Uh, and so they are not sure whether or not the courtyard will have uh, hardscapes and softscapes that um, I've, I already said that it's probably not a good idea to have grass inside the courtyard because now we're mowing and that's going to be a little bit of an issue. Uh, the reason behind the courtyard is because since we're going with this pod concept, that's the only way to have windows on both sides, that if we didn't have an interior courtyard, then we've got some classrooms with windows and some classrooms without windows. 
Sure. Well, thanks. The traffic flow on the top page, you know, at, in the top right where cars are entering from the street, and then they reach a point where the long road comes through. There's a merging point there. That looks like it could be a building. Mm -hmm. We must have, uh, when the architects presented this to the team at Edison, I believe we spent 45 minutes talking about that one area. Um, and the, the conversation kind of ended with, at this point, we're going to have to work with our families and figure out how students are going to be dismissed so that that merge point doesn't become a, a tension point for it. Uh, right now, all of the students at Edison exit out one door, they line up outside, the parents come and get them. This has the potential of changing the way that they dismiss students. They are aware of that at Edison. They have been talking through what that process would look like uh, so that that doesn't become a, a bottleneck. Another one looks like where the parent loop exits below that and the buses enter mm -hmm. on the street. With the buses lining up there to turn in and the cars coming out, that looks like a couple potentially some spot. Currently, there is one bus from the city and one bus from the YMCA that picks up students because such a large percentage of their population are walkers. And so, um, even if we increase that to four buses, that bus loop will be able to accommodate four buses. I guess I'm staking the picture of what it's like on the bigger screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good phase in there. So you mentioned at the February committee, the whole, the architects would be here. Mm -hmm. Will the Edison administration or some team be here as well so that we can also ask them their thoughts on some of these items? I've already mentioned it to the administration there. Great. If we would like more representation from that building, I'm, I'm sure that their team would be more than happy to, to come. And on that note of getting feedback, will this be presented to the families at Edison to get their thoughts as well? Yes. In addition to it being presented to the families, because it's a brand new building, we do have to go through the Act 34 process in which we will have a meeting to present the entire thing to the public, where it's kind of a very regimented meeting that we have to go through, um, which we're working through when that will be. Most likely that will be sometime in March. It makes the most sense to just hold that meeting at Edison as opposed to bringing in somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But will it be too far in the process to make changes? Like if something is heard at that meeting that is a significant concern from the families, will 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 we still have time to make those changes? I believe we will. Okay. Uh, like I said, uh, this is the sixth iteration of okay. this and they've been very good about making changes based on the recommendations of the, the, at least the team at Edison. So we'll be able to solicit any of the feedback at that point. Thank you. Almost now the front lawn, there's, there's figurines on the lawn. Oh, in the courtyard area? In the front, mm -hmm. on 6th Street. It's like, oh. And there's a bench dedicated mm -hmm. to a former Edison teacher, Kathy Shoup. Mm -hmm. Will those be preserved? Kathy? We have not gotten into that level of detail as far as those items, as well as Mr. Brenneman's suggestion of using the archway. Those are also things that we can include in the final design, whether it lives in the courtyard, whether it lives outside somewhere in one of the play areas, these are all things that we do have time to, to get them in. That's what I was gonna say. Two things I mentioned and what Mr. Brown mentioned, mm -hmm. maybe the replacement courtyard would be the home. Even if not the courtyard, but if you mentioned the figurines somewhere on the outside of the line. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Before we move on to uh, enrollment report, I do want to let the board know that Ms. Pickens had to um, step away from the meeting. She had put a little note up there. I'm not sure if everyone saw it, so she is no longer on the meeting. Okay, enrollment report, Mr. Brockman. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, so I will say that we did this about a year ago, almost to the month, uh, and this is something that we said that we would do, and so I believe that we're looking at doing this quarterly. And so what you are looking at is the altered um, 
display of our enrollment report, uh, obviously not like the, the report that is approved at the um, monthly meeting, uh, but this is a, a bigger snapshot of where we are in time. Uh, the first two pages are just raw numbers. These numbers were pulled last week on the first. Uh, the top chart shows each of our individual buildings. So this is where our students are going to school. So if you are a cyber student, then you're associated with Apollo, as opposed to some of the other reports where it says if you're an East student, even though you're at the cyber program, you count and the East headcount. So this is a legitimate headcount of who is actively in those buildings. Below that were our, our cyber and charter numbers, um, the whole district grouping them by uh, charter and then cyber charter, and then it breaks it out into the individual schools. Our cyber students are assigned to their home districts. So in rather this, than Gridley? In, in this report, they're grouped at the Gridley. When the, the monthly report that is approved at the board meeting, they are associated with their home schools. And one suggestion we do have this this report um, that Neil's sharing with you minus the the charts is much easier to read than the report that we uh, have you approve at the meeting. So we could swap the meet the report that you have at the meeting approve the meeting out for this one and have you approve this one each month because I think it is more meaningful than what we're providing you now. Yeah, I think it's great. It's really a nice job. Okay. So then starting in February, we'll make sure that this is the student enrollment report that is on the agenda. Questions for Mr. Brockman about the report? Well, I was appalled to see this huge increase in enrollment in prep, but I forgot they closed Villa and correct. You can add Villa, they're down 20. So some of those girls have good taste. Uh, the, the rest of the graphics that are on here uh, follow suit with the graphics that we showed you about uh, a year ago. Uh, each graph is set up the same way. We've got it by grade bands, and then the top bar is the entirety of what that graph is showing. So the first one shows all of the residents of the, the school age residents of the city of Erie. And the good news is that overall, from last year when the data was pulled to this year, there was an increase in the overall number of students for Erie. If you look prior to that, prior five years, there was a small and steady decline. So the fact that we are starting to go in the other direction is good news for us, good news for everybody in the city. Um, the next chart is the cyber charter enrollment. Uh, as you can see, as of right now, well, at least when the data was pulled, we do see a slight increase from the prior year. Uh, and I know that Mr. Polito has spoken at length uh, several times about what we were trying to do to curb that to get some of those students back. Yeah, and it's always at one school that Pennsylvania. PA like cyber. Half of them are right. Yeah, PA cyber is the biggest. And you think they, they one do have the a relatively good program? Not that they're paying cable bills or something like that. They're, well, they, they opened a new facility in the area, and so they're recruiting heavier than. They oh, where are they now? They were at the mall at one time, right? Years ago. That's where they are. That's where they are. Is that where they are now? Well, yeah, that's where we've seen our major increase in students. We actually are starting to see we have more students leave for cyber over the last couple months. So, Erica and are actually uh, going through and contacting some of the parents. We're going to try to identify why they're leaving uh, for, for that uh, cyber charter instead of our program and, and hopefully make some adjustments to, to either bring them back or stop that. Uh, but we out enroll them all combined, right? We've got 946 yes. in their spot. That's a huge. Yes. Yeah, that's, that, that's huge a lot role. for the district. Well, McDowell does not have a program, do they have no free? I believe they do. Are they starting one now, or they did not have one at one point? Yeah, if we wouldn't have had that uh, just in the pandemic, we would have lost probably about another $5 million a year. Yes. And that really hasn't tailed off with us that much. No, no. Yeah, so thank you, Mr. Nichols. The next graph on the, in the packet is our in-house cyber enrollment. And as you did note, we, we are, bigger than all of our competitors put together, which is very good news um, yeah. for us. 
besides the fact that we think that we just have a better product. Uh, the next chart is our brick and mortar uh, charter enrollments. Uh, so that's Rise, Montessori, uh, Perseus House, and RB Wiley. Um, you can see, when, again, when the data was pulled, we did see a slight increase uh, from last year as far as that overall enrollment is. Um, the good thing is, is that we are at or one above at the time, the peak level for what our um, brick and mortar uh, charter enrollment was, which was in 1920. So we're, we have one more student than the highest that we've seen. And there's been a huge reduction at Erie Ride. That is correct. 359 down to 286, you know, as you were pointing out that they were having some difficult. Yeah. Um, when we look at the next one, that's our traditional enrollment. So that's um, students who are going to our schools. Uh, you can see that there was a big increase there from when the data was pulled, which is also a good sign. Some of that is because we did take back some of our students from our cyber charter enrollment. Uh, another impact, we believe, is some of the refugee students who were brought into the country the last couple of months. That's our total enrollment? That is the number of students who are in our buildings, our traditional program oh, buildings. So it doesn't include our cyber students. So it does not include okay. our cyber students. Yeah, right. The next chart is our private and parochial. Obviously, we have to track that as the district of residency. Um, the numbers are what they are at that point with them. And then the last one, or the last two, we've got all of our charter enrollment, which um, again, we, we see a, a slight increase from our last from two years ago, which was the, the, the highest. Uh, we do see an overall increase at this time, specifically because of the cyber charter enrollment. Uh, the last graphic is our EPS enrollment. So this is the total number of students that we have. This does not include the students who are in pre-K. So if you look at the first page and you see the total of 10,057, and then you look at the back page and you're like, well, why are we only at 9840? 49. That's because for this graphic, I removed all of our pre-K students from the count. You have back at the beginning, you have early intervention being 240 students. Would that be uh, pre-K? So that's a pre-K and then a special education early intervention program. And that is that different institutions or? or uh, it could be. Different institutions. I mean, there's an X in front of it for some reason. X the, the X has to do with the naming of the calendar. That's more of an internal okay. naming of it. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Brockman? Yeah, I was reading something. Why, why are those out of the city parochial schools on that second page? Because city kids go there? Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay, any other questions? Thanks, Mr. Brockman, for putting that together. Okay, we will move on. Item seven is review of the draft agenda for our January 18th meeting. Any questions about the draft agenda? And Ms. Jones, you'll update it now with the items we added for the voting, okay? Okay. No questions on the draft agenda? Then we move on to item eight. Any other matter? Everyone has talked out this evening. Okay. Okay. With no other matter, then uh, we will adjourn this meeting. And then I believe we have an executive session for personnel and legal matters. Am I correct? Okay. So this meeting is adjourned. We'll, we st we'll stay in here for Mr. Brenneman's. Yeah. Okay. So we'll. Take five. Okay, bye. Thank you.